That just means I need to get yeah, the next button. Now. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Not that bad. <laughs> one more time. I thought we were going to do it one more time. Remedial now the learning. answers won't change. Yeah. Yeah. There was... Remedial learning. So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the Those of you watching online, we're glad to have you here. You guys said one more time, and there's this viral video from, I think, America's Got Talent, and this guy is wearing like 50 of the, those uh, construction vests that you see construction workers and, and people on the roadside working. And you take one off, and then all of a sudden you hear, one more time, and you take another one off. And he just, Simon just was beyond himself. But <laughs> weird what your mind does to you or fix you. So let's take it somewhere else. So this morning, uh, we just have a few announcements before we get uh, to our time of worship this morning. Join us this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock as we start Season 3 of The Chosen. We're already going to be starting Season 3. That means we're two seasons in, 16 weeks in already, uh, as of today with the sermon series. So uh, pretty cool that we have gotten that. And uh, as Diane goes to the next screen, this is just a little screenshot of our website. If you go up to where it says grow at the top, select the chosen, you can down, doesn't matter, I'm not going to be biased about what kind of phone you have. So you can either click Google Play or App Store uh, for Apple, and you can download the Chosen's app and watch the videos there if you can join us on Wednesday night. Or if you want to rewatch a few, you can do it that way. And then further over on the far right is one that just says watch online. So if you click that, it takes you to angel.com and you can watch The Chosen directly on the website there. So, love to have you do that. Now, if you do have your cell phone with you today, and it's, well, they're not, they call them smartphones, they're not really that smart. <laughs> they're smarter than me. Well, they, they tend to be about as smart as a person using it, right? <laughs> so, when you go, if you've got a Facebook, go out to your Facebook, pull it up, go to Grace Street Church. And at Grace Street Church, you're gonna see the live feed and there's a share button, a little arrow that kind of curves and points off to the right. Click on that and you can share the live feed to your news feed. And that will open up the number of people that see that, the, or have the potential to see uh, these messages. And we believe these messages are extremely important. So we would love to have that fill up with as many as we possibly can. In fact, if we can get to from 18, to a thousand subscribers on our YouTube channel, we'd be able to live stream directly to YouTube as well, opening up even more. So we have just a little bit left to go there, but we can definitely get there. So just some things on that. We've got a busy couple of weeks coming up. Next Saturday is a busy day. At 9 a.m. we'll have men's breakfast. The room will transform into a restaurant and we will be enjoying a meal together along with fellowship and a word from the Lord. Then following that afternoon, well, late afternoon, early evening, doors open at 5.30, movie at 6, we'll be showing Narnia, Prince Caspian. So if you haven't seen this movie, you'd want to join us for that. It's going to be a great uh, movie. If you're watching online, when you get to the point where you see the link for the music, after you watch all the music videos, there's a trailer for the video so you can see how awesome this movie really is. So uh, play that. We'll show it to those of you that are here in person at the end of the service today. And then following the following weekend on the 14th of October, we have the ninth race of the 18th season orange track racing. We will have registration starting about 930 with racing started at approximately 10 o'clock. People tend to stream in a little bit after that. So we want to make sure that anybody and everybody can race at once too so sometimes we'll delay the start of the races just to accommodate everyone because we want everybody to have fun and then finally mark will also be putting in that link that i was talking about to the youtube playlist that gives you the music for today as well as the video uh, for the trailer <clears throat> father god settle our minds settle our hearts Open our ears, open our minds to the message that you have given to Mark this morning. Father, we just thank you that you have provided him this message, this message about good news in bad times. 
and that no matter what we're going through, Father, that you are there. You are walking along beside us, whether we choose to accept the fact that you are right there, Father, or not. You are always, always there. And we thank you for that assurance. In Jesus' name, amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from 2 Timothy chapter 1, and this is 8b through 10. So it'll be the second half of uh, verse 8 through verse 10. And hear what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, With the strength of God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of this plain to us by appearing, by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. Now it's important to realize that at this time, when Paul is writing this, this nugget of encouragement to Timothy, he is locked away in jail. He is in prison. He's in prison for the very beliefs that he used to arrest Christians for and throw them into jail. And just as God called Paul to this holy life that he's talking about here, so he calls each and every one of us. It's because the persecution of his believers or of the believers that Paul did not deserve God's grace. He deserved what he was giving to the believers by throwing him in jail, but rather he encountered Christ on the road to Damascus. He had his Jesus moment, his come to Jesus moment, if you will. Now, this was also a time of mounting persecution of believers, not much unlike today. Verses 9 and 10 are a quick summary of the good news. And, and here's three quick points from it. God loves us. God chose us. And he sent Jesus to die for us. This is good news. And we can have eternal life through Jesus Christ because he broke the bonds of that death. We don't deserve to be saved. But this is how much God truly loves us. And as we invite Mark up here, to give us the message this morning, my last point for you is believe and receive the word that you hear today. Amen? Father, thank you again for this word that you've given us this morning. Call my heart. Settle us down, Father, so that we can hear and we can take in and we can go out into the world as we leave today later and take this message and truly use it in our daily lives. In Jesus' name. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Good. Look at that sun. Shining, beautiful. beautiful blue sky outside. Great fall day. A little warmer than what I'd want it to be, but uh, still in all, it's a beautiful day to be in the presence of God. So I want to take you back to our call to worship this morning in that last line. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. And that's key to what we want to talk about today because we got a lot of bad news going on out there. and We need some good news in bad times because let's face it, the world's not in really, really great shape right now. So have you heard any good news lately? Well, if you watch TV or if you watch the evening news, it's kind of hard to find that little nugget of good news in amongst all the bad news. It always seems like one side is fighting the other side about something or other when it comes to the world today. So there's no real good news there. There's just a lot of fighting, a lot of turmoil, and a lot of, of unrest. So when we look at society today, it has settled into this cycle of bad news and infighting and everything. Uh, we can search high and low and not find harmony, agreement, or civility 
and that's been a big one lately in the last probably 10 years. We don't agree to disagree on anything anymore. We just disagree and violently. Uh, so the world right now that we live in is really in turmoil. You know, it's, it's not a friendly place to be. We live in a time of cancel culture. I think everybody knows what cancel culture. If you don't agree with us, then we're going to take you down. We're going to destroy your character. We're going to ruin your life, right? So is this something brand new in the world today? No, no, it's not. So if you think it's new, think again. If we go back into our last uh, episode here, uh, season two, episode eight, we see the Pharisees and we see this guy, he's literally almost foaming at the mouth. He just can't wait to destroy the other Pharisee and his house and make his whole father's house that he built this lifelong reputation on. He wants to destroy them because they don't agree. They've got a disagreement over semantics of how they should enforce the law of Moses. But see, that wasn't their job to start with. The Pharisees were supposed to be holy men, separated, set apart from the rest of society. They dedicated their lives to serving God. But instead, they ended up serving the law and lost God in the process. And so... In those days, what was going to happen? Well, one Pharisee wanted to take down the other Pharisee because they were at odds against each other. They didn't agree with them, so they were going to pay with their reputations being impugned, their livelihood being destroyed because they disagreed on ideology, semantics. So where is God in any of that? See, God wasn't present in any of that. That's the whole thing. And see, when we take a look and we step back and we look at society today and we look at the people who are practicing the cancel culture, there's no God in that either. That's the problem. We've removed God so much from so many facets of our life. God was the standard by which people lived their lives up until about, seriously, 80 years ago. That's when it all started, back in the 50s. We had a counterculture movement that started then. See, and when you can't find God in any of that, where God is not to be found, standing on the streets, making spectacles about themselves, like the Pharisees did, and we watched that in the episode, they were rocking back and forth, and you know, people come up, talk to them, no, nope, no, nope, talk to the hand, the face isn't listening to you. You know, go away from me, because I'm making a spectacle, and people have to look at me. See, they were supposed to be worshiping God bringing people into a relationship with God, but they were worshiping themselves in the process. See, there was no God found there either. So where's humanity in any of that? Where's humanity? See, as, as a representative of God, if you're called to be in, in as a pastor to help shepherd the rest of the community to God, you put them first before yourselves. But see, they were putting themselves first. And the people would come sometime afterwards. So where's humanity in any of that? Well, it's missing. It's devoid. It wasn't there. And Jesus pretty much summed it up uh, in Matthew 12, 34. Jesus proclaims, You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. <coughs> And Jesus called these guys, the Pharisees at the time, a brood of vipers because of the wickedness in their hearts. So they, had no, they had no call to be helping the people. They were all there to help themselves. See, the heart is what matters to Jesus. Every word and action will flow from the heart. Our heart is our holy of holies inside of our body. It's the presence of our soul. And so out of the heart, that's what matters to Jesus, what comes out of your heart, not from your lips. A pure heart in Christ will make pure action. And what I mean by that is if we keep our lives and our hearts focused on Christ, then by the power of the Holy Spirit and by guidance of the Holy Spirit, we will be perfected into his image. Now, I just want to stop right there because I use that word perfected. 
Testament. See, that's an ancient Hebrew term. And I want you to understand, it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. It means that we'd be groomed in the image of Christ. We were made to be in God's image. But what that means is we have to have those attributes of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. We're groomed into that. We grow into that. It's not immediately, boom, here all of a sudden you have all the fruits of the Spirit. It doesn't work that way. But as we come into that relationship with Christ, as we come into our relationship with God, then those things will be given unto us. He will reveal those things unto us. We will be groomed into his image. And that is what it means by that Hebrew term, perfected into the image of Christ. So that pure heart will make pure action. And so that's really, really central to us. We have to understand that out of the heart flows everything. All of our actions, our character, and everything comes from what's in your heart. We live out what's in our hearts. We're moved towards action with Christ in our hearts, and that's called Christian action. So if anybody who's been through the walk to Emmaus in here, they know about a, a talk in the middle of the walk, and it's called Christian action. And this is what it's about. It's, it's about how you act and react to the society around you and how you reach out to help others. How you reach out to help others. Those without a heart for Christ, without a love for Christ, will have their actions moved by worldly things. Things that may not lead towards salvation and instead may lead them towards eternal damnation instead. Because they don't have a heart for Christ. They don't have a heart. They don't have that humanity in their heart. Therefore, we must be vigilant to guard our hearts against the actions of the world. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Sound familiar? Yeah. Because that's what Jesus was quoting back to them, was that proverb that came through. The Hebrew translation for guard means to keep your heart above all things. Guard your heart. Keep it above all things. Don't let it succumb to the worldly actions and to the things of the world. So above all, you guard your marriage. You guard your family. You guard your bank account. You guard your passwords, your car, your house. You guard your heart with more vigilance than anything else. You keep that above all of the other stuff. All the rest of that stuff is stuff. King Solomon goes on in the proverb to say to guard your heart because it is the wellspring of your life. In other words, it is the source of everything else in your life. If you guard your heart and you keep your heart whole and pure and holy, then that is the wellspring for the rest of your life. And you will live out a fulfilled life in Christ. So... Jesus says he wants our hearts above all other things because your heart will guard your life. He didn't want us to end up like that brood of vipers caught up in enforcing the law. And in doing so, they missed out on worshiping God in the process. When we worship, we give our hearts to God. That's the key right there. When we worship, like we're doing here today. We're here today to join together in communion with each other to lift each other up. Remember what that Hebrew term is? So we lift our hearts up, right? So we lift our hearts in communion with each other. That's worship. We lift them up to God. We must repent from our heart and not our lips because it is the source of everything else in our life. So people can give lip service to just about anything. You can say whatever you want to. It can come out of your mark. But what comes out of your heart is what Jesus wants. Because that's pure and holy. And out of the heart flows everything else in your life. Another aspect of this episode of episode 8 that we just watched on Wednesday night, I thought was striking when the first scene opened. We saw the land that was the promised land that was going all the way back to what Abraham, the covenants that were given with Abraham, and they came to that promised land, and, he, and here he was. It was being bargained for pe with, by people for that had less than honorable intentions. With no regard to the heritage or the significance of that land being given by God to the people of Israel. 
And so he, uh, Yashat, I think is what his name was in the, in the episode, mm -hmm. he says, well, this has been in my family for 40 generations. 40 generations. So I'm not just going to give it up to just anybody. He was looking for that purity in their heart. He wanted to know that these people were going to be honorable with their intentions. He wanted to know that this was going to be an honorable purpose. And so what did they do? They lied to him. They lied to him and said, well, you know, in these days with people and, the, and all the taxes that are upon them, they have no money to bury themselves. And so we're going to carve tombs in the side. But actually what they were doing is they were going to mine that area for salt so that they can make a fortune. Less than honorable. Out of the lips can say anything, but out of the heart flows your character. And they showed their character pretty well right up front. So when the deal was done, it left me with an uneasy feeling just watching it. And I can imagine what that landowner your chef felt like. Smooth talking, underhandedness are the traits of Satan. Using deceit and lies to get what they wanted, then later to gloat about how they tricked the old man into selling because they had that potential for such great wealth from the land. Salt was what was used in those days as money. It was bartered for trade. So you traded salt for all kinds of different things. So it was the currency of the day, and they figured they're going to make a ton of money if they open up a salt mine in those fields. Later on, we learned that it was Judas was one of the men making the deal. Now, they seem to later to redeem themselves somewhat in helping secure the field for the Sermon on the Mount. But see, it had more to do with the future business deals that they could rake out of the thing than really truly being pure of heart. At least that's what I surmised from, from their character. See how the heart flows their character. And they showed their character early on. Again, there's some artistic license that these... Actual events aren't recorded in the Bible, but it does make for an interesting storyline. So then moving on to the next scene, we see that Rama and Mary were studying and preparing for the sermon, and we hear the verse in Psalm 139, 13 through 16. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in other seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Now a lot of people, if they read that in Psalms, they, they, they probably don't understand what all that means. They don't take it upon that meaning. But what it was saying is, God has already numbered your days. He's already got a plan for your life. Before you were even born, he put that plan into action. And so you have to understand that your life isn't done by accident. All the trials, everything else, that's to help build that character. To help form your heart. Now, you have the choice on what you do with that heart. You have the choice of what God gives you and how you put it into action. See, out of the heart flows everything else in your life. It's the wellspring. Everything flows from there. God put it into place. You have to put it into action. He put it into place before we were born, but it's up to us to take that first step, to take that action step. And if you notice, as Rayma was reading the verse, Mary had this moment of clarity, an epiphany of how God had planned her life out before the first day had passed. How often do we get those moments of clarity? The light bulb goes off and then an epiphany emerges out of it. And we go, oh, yeah. Some people call it deja vu at times. But it's a moment of epiphany when God reveals what he wants for our lives. It usually happens to me when I'm writing a sermon, and I guess for me that's when I'm really concentrating on God and what he wants me to say and what he's saying to me at that time. 
the light bulb goes off. Now, the weird thing is, as I'm writing the sermon, I might be writing along and thinking I'm doing a great job, and my dog goes, yeah, that's not what I want. And so I've got to wipe it all out, <laughs> and he fills my head full of other things. But that's allowing yourself to open up to God and letting him talk to you. So, as I was writing this, it came to me how wonderful it must have been to study and learn without the distractions of the world and learn in the presence of God in Christ Jesus in the flesh. Wouldn't that be awesome? I think that would be just incredible. And then to be able to be a part of the whole thing, living it with Jesus every day really made me wonder what it would have been like to be there, to live in that moment. And I got to thinking, you know, if you look at it, he, he kind of chose a ragtag group of people. They weren't all the same. They came from different walks of life. But did you notice what, what he chose? He chose people that didn't have high professions in the day to follow him. He chose the ones who were burdened or outcasts in society, the rejects, the ones that society threw away. And then if you watch as we go through this, that's what I think is so great about this. You watch the people being transformed by being in the living presence of God. Their lives are transformed. From the inside out, they're being changed. And I think that is awesome. And I think that would be just wonderful to be living in that moment. Jesus was going to be giving the greatest sermon ever written, ever recorded. And there you are. You got a front row seat. How awesome would that be? I mean, they, they made it out like a rock concert, right? They had the stage, come through the curtain, you know. Had the security guys up front. I was going to wear my security shirt today, my blade, you know, my bright yellow one with the big black security cross front. I decided better not, better not do that. But see, to be a part of that whole thing, living it out with Christ day to day, I mean that that had to be transforming. You could not walk away from that and not be changed completely inside out. Your heart would have been renewed in the spirit of Christ, living it out day by day. Wow. See, he was going to be giving the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is the instructions for life itself. If you listen to it, it is the instructions for life itself. And that's why it's the most important sermon ever given. Do you realize what's contained in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, were in that sermon? How to be a godly people, how to live in a godly society, how to act and interact with each other, how to treat each other as, as godly people. He gave it in one sermon. Something to aspire to, right here? There he is, yeah, yep. <laughs> what would it take to you to follow like they did? What would it take you to drop everything and follow Christ like that? See, he's calling us to do that anyway today. Give up everything. Go on the road. You don't know where you're going day to day, but see, you were with him. And you just knew it was going to be right. You just knew it was going to be good. As we see Jesus preparing early each morning for the sermon, we see his disciples and they're still filled with doubt. They're still filled with questions. They're arguing amongst themselves. They can't, they, can't really, they can't really break free from the world and what they're used to in their lives. But see, they're still being transformed little by little. I like the way they portray the humanness of the disciples. See, they were just like us, right? Just like us. We see Mary worried that she's going to slip away again. And it's like that song from Casting Crowns that says, I feel like I'm just one mistake away for you leaving me this way. I think we've all been there at least once in our lives where we just think we're, we're just one mistake away from God leaving us there, leaving us in that place, stuck in that rut of the world in life. Jesus wants to be warriors 
not worriers. He wants us to be prayer warriors on fire for Christ. See, most of the time we spend our lives being worriers on what's going to happen the next day or how am I going to get out of this next situation. But see, he wants us to be warriors instead. He wants us to be prayer warriors, to go to him in prayer each and every time we face a situation. Before we have to face the situation, we go to him as a prayer warrior for Christ, on fire for him. We give ourselves to God and yet we're pulled away by worldly things like worry and doubt. And now don't get me wrong, some doubt is not a bad thing because it can cause us to dig deeper for answers and deepen our faith in the process. But see, when we allow that worry to take over our lives, and we allow that worry to become destructive within our lives, that's when we gotta we gotta step back and we gotta look at it. We gotta go to God and we say, "Hey, we 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 need to not doubt all this stuff. We need not to worry about it." There's lots of passages through the Bible about worry. Jesus addresses it in the Sermon on the Mount because it is so prevalent within our human nature. And in Matthew 6, 34, he says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And see, there's many, many other verses that talk to that as well, because it is so prevalent in our human nature to worry about things and to doubt. But what he wants us to do, he wants us to be warriors, not worriers. He wants us to go to God. He wants us to call upon him. We, he wants us to lean upon him and not upon our own understanding. So it's by our very nature to question things that we don't know the answer to. It's when we let those questions turn to destructive doubt that it can affect our entire life. It upsets that character. It upsets that heart. See, when we allow worry to come in, we didn't guard our heart properly. And that affects the rest of the outflow for our life. Scripture tells us to cast our care upon the Lord because he will care for you. And that comes from 1 Peter 5, 7. And that is in reference to Psalm 55. Give your burdens to the Lord and he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. See, if we only take those messages to heart, notice what I said there. Take the messages to heart that God would give us, then we would most likely have a better life, a different outcome, a fulfilled life, because we're leaning on God first instead of ourselves. We're guarding our heart from the worries and the doubt and the destruction that come along with it. I read that when we worry, we're taking our fears out of God's hands and placing it into our own. And that rings pretty true at times. I know I have that problem. The thing is, God cannot work in our lives if we don't let him. He can't solve our problems if we keep getting in the way. I want you to take that home with you for this next week. We, God cannot work in our lives if we keep getting in his way. There's another saying that I really enjoy is, God's not done writing our story, so quit trying to steal the pen. We want to write our own story, don't we? See, that's our humanist that that speaks up and wants to take that pen away from God. But see, he's the one. He's the perfecter of our lives. We can't allow our lives to be perfected by God when we're stealing the pen and trying to write our own stuff. What I mean to point out here is our humanness, we tend to cut God out of the picture. We try to do it on our own, and that usually fails. Then we end up in even deeper than what we started off to be. So most people act out of fear first, and when that doesn't work, then, then we tend to move back to God. We need to start with God first, and we won't get to that fear factor. We won't get to that point. See, fear does not stop death. It stops life. It stops life. And worrying does not take away tomorrow's problems. It takes away today's peace. I posted that up on Facebook, and I had a private message. I mean, it was like two minutes later. I had a private message come back in. 
and they said, do you care if I use this? And I said, please, that's what they're there for. Copy and paste them, share whatever you wanna do. But it spoke so profoundly to that person in Raleigh, North Carolina, that they said, can I use this? Because I needed to hear this today. And then we went on with a whole dialogue of what he was struggling with and what he was going through with his daughter and the relationship with his daughter. And he said, this is exactly what I needed to hear. Exactly. So this is a truth that I want you to hold on to here. That fear does not stop death. It stops life. It stops life. And worrying does not take away from tomorrow's troubles. It takes away today's peace. So we got to get away from that. We need to stop and understand that God is in the control, not us. God has the big stuff covered. He can handle it when we can't. We got a huge God. We're just a little tiny bit in God's whole universe, but we're still important to God. See, once we resign our self and our thoughts to these truths, then life becomes different. It becomes easier. Freedom is restored. Sanity is restored because we don't have to go crazy trying to fit way to figure out how to fix all the stuff in life. We give it to God in prayer and we move on. The key is we move on. But the bigger thing in the picture is we give it to God first. This is what Jesus was saying, and he was trying to tell people in the Sermon on the Mount. We can't live in the world and not be affected by it. We need not to look for those things that distract us from God. We need to look to those things that will mimic the image of God, and that's what it means to be created in God's image. That's what it means to be created in God's image. We need to represent Christ to others. Represent God to others in our actions, in our character, in our thoughts, in our deeds, in our interactions with everyone else. We need to represent. We're a representative of Christ. So we're just going to put a little hyphen in the middle. Represent Christ. That's the way I want you to think about it. And that's what the Sermon on the Mount was about. This means what it means to be created in God's image is to be that community of believers. He started the sermon with a vision of what those believers looked like. And moreover, what we should seek them out to find them, find these people and be in communion with them, be together to lift each other up and to edify each other. Matthew records them in chapter 5, starting with verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is what we're talking about, this fulfilled life. Jesus is giving us the building blocks for life. We need to wake up and we need to listen. Blessed are the merciful, before, before they shall obtain mercy. We don't find that mercy in our society today. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Oops, sorry. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of things evil against you are falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The building blocks of life how we're supposed to act and react with people in our lives. It tells you how to get the blessings in your life to have a fulfilled life. All we have to do is look for people. It doesn't mean that you're all these things. It means that all of us together are these things. In communion, in community with one another. So I want you to look around the room today and I think you'll see those people. You'll see those people here at Grace Street Church 
We all strive to be those people and to have those qualities, not all of them individually, but when we come together. See, we have strength as we come together because each one of us has different talents, different gifts from God. And as we come together, we blend those talents together and we're stronger as a whole than we are as an individual. See, when we come together, we have become the image of God. Have you ever thought about that? As we come together, we become the image of God, the likeness of God. What I love is before the church service, you know, for, I come in early, but as people come in, we come in and what do we do? We talk to each other, we commune with each other, we lift each other up. If we're having problems, we talk to each other about them. We share in the care for each other and we pray for each other. When we form this ministry, it's called Prayer, Care, Share Ministries. That's what owns Grace Street Church, Orange Track Racing. And there's a reason for it. We didn't do it just out of whim. But as we prayerfully come together and we care for each other and we share the burdens of the day, we can lift each other up out of the world and we can become the image of God. This is what we strive for to be in life, to be that image of God. Jesus showed us the way. He gave us the instructions to live a good and fulfilled life. I have to ask, are you listening? Are you following? Are you willing to live in the image of God today? Think about it. Let's pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for the word that you've given us today. We thank you for the, for the blessings that you pour upon us each and every day of grace, mercy, love. We thank you that you put people in our lives as we go through our lives, especially as we're struggling, to help lift us up, to give us that hand up, and to move forward and move on with our lives. So, Lord God, we just praise you and thank you that we have this opportunity to gather here freely and openly to share in your word, to share the burdens of the day with each other, to lift each other up, to edify us Thank you, Lord God, that you are so faithful to us, that you are so good to us, and you pour out your love on us each and every day. Thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Jesus will say so much in this, what's called the Sermon on the Mount, in this big event, as he, they call it in, this, in the chosen. Fast forward to the end of his ministry, when he is eating that final meal with his disciples. He will say so much in just a few words. In the middle of the meal, of the final meal, he'll take the bread and he will break it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. And as Mark mentioned in this most recent episode, we're introduced to Judas. The thing that we have to remember is when Jesus is taking us through this final meal, when he is telling us that this bread is broken, Judas is amongst them. Judas is there. Scripture tells us that as often as we eat of this bread and drink this cup, we are to do so until Christ returns. And as much as we want him to come back today, he will not return 
until God is satisfied that any and every single person that he knows will accept him has had that opportunity. And then Jesus will return. And we can take this meal with him. Until that time, let us share this meal together. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and drink. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Gracious Father, we thank you for what this meal represents. It represents the culmination of the gospel. It's the culmination of the good news that Jesus came. You sent him, your only son, to die for us on the cross, to take our sins, each and every one, past, present, and future, upon himself. He then defeated death. And now, because of that, those of us who have chosen him as our Lord and Savior, who have confessed it with our mouth, we are made righteous in your eyes. And when it is our time to leave this world, we will come into your presence, Father. Thank you for this undeserved gift. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a wonderful time of our service where we get to share with each other the burdens that we have, whether they are burdens for those that are sick among us, those that are dealing with loss, those who are in need of financial assistance or looking for work or a place to live, Father. This is where we can come together and share in this. Are there any prayers that would need to be lifted up this morning? As you can tell, Denise is not here. Mornings are hard for her as her shoulder continues to heal. And so we pray for continued healing for that. Joe, your surgery is coming up very quickly. He is without a cane or anything else, running around like a, a young man again, viva fast. <laughs> well, as soon as you're done with the other knee, maybe so. Might have to keep up with you. But we just found out this morning that uh, after a meeting with his doctor, that Mark will be having surgery in January to have a full knee reconstruction. He is bone on bone. So we pray for that. That is a painful painful thing to go through. We have so many other prayers. Uh, those are contained within our prayer sheets that we give out on Wednesday night. If you would like to be on our prayer sheet and you're not getting those on your email, please let us know. Uh, you can uh, message us privately on Facebook or on social media. Send us an email at info at gracestreet.church. Any of those ways can come to us. But even though Denise could not be with us this morning, and she doesn't, I don't think she knows this, but she gave us some scripture this morning and some words of wisdom, and I want to share those with you this morning. And she picked this passage out of 1 Peter 5, starting 5b through 11. It says this, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift up he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. In his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. Amen? Amen. Now that message she had for you. And the beauty of, of our church and our church family is that we do have a text chat that goes on. And any time we are in need, we can reach out in that moment and say, hey, help, I need prayer. You might not even say what that prayer is for, and you might not even need to. God already knows, but when we come together as one, God is there to hear our prayers. 
Denise went on to say that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. <coughs> Cast your cares on the one who knows your inmost being. Let Jesus guide your every step. Do not give in to the evil of this world. Take up your shield of faith, your breastplate of righteousness, your helmet of salvation. In here she is saying, go to Ephesians 6 and read about the armor of God and put on all of it. She says, gird yourself with the belt of truth and the shoe of peace. Be a light to those around you and may God give you an abundant life. Be bold and full of courage. And as I read that this morning, I, all I could think of was, we, we talk, as pastors, we have a tendency to pray a hedge of protection around everyone. It sounds kind of funny, but it is. It, it, when you put it into context, it's real. It's putting a barrier between you and those things of the world that are evil. So if someone is coming up to you and they're babbling all kinds of nonsense, put a wall between you. It may not be a physical wall that they can see, but it might just be you standing up, grabbing your stuff, and walking away. You don't need that in your life. So be bold and full of courage. Be vigilant in your prayers, and God will walk you into the life he has for you. Sometimes it's so difficult. We feel like God is far away from us, but he is taking us through a time, a test, a testing time, and we will walk out the other side with a testimony. And Denise's final words to you all is, be blessed this day. Amen? Amen. God loves all of you. Father, we pray for those who are hurting whether it's because they have an illness, Father, because they need surgery, because of a loss. It may be financial. It may be needing a job. It may be needing a new home. We don't know what all the prayers are, Father. We know a bunch of them. And each day of every week, Father, we pray for an entire list of people that we pray a softened heart upon their stony heart, that they would be softened, that they would come to hear your word, Father, and that they would turn and believe in you, Father, because without you, we have no hope. Give us the hope to share with this darkened world, Father. We know you're right beside us walking there, Father. We can feel you, your presence. Continue to put that barrier between us and the evil of this world, Father. We thank you and praise you and all God's people said, This brings us to the end of our online portion of our service this morning. I thank you for being with us. Uh, I do ask that you would go through and, and uh, listen to the music that we have uh, uh, procured for you this morning. And uh, it should hopefully speak to your heart like it did to mine. But I want you to understand that you are found and forgiven by God. See, we're all struggling. We're all lost at some point in time in our life. But God seeks us out. He finds us. And he forgives us through his unending grace, mercy, and love. Let us pray. Lord God, we come before you today and we humble our hearts to you. We've messed up and fallen short of the glory of God. But you assure us that is not where we have to stay, lost in a lost world. We don't have to be trapped by worry and doubt. We just need to call on you didn't create us to be warriors. You created us to be warriors and to pray earnestly from our heart. Thank you for your unending love and forgiveness. Help us to be strong in you, strong in our faith that keeps us from falling and brings us into your glory, Lord. Restore us. Reconcile us today. Redeem us. Lord Jesus, we pray this in your holy name. And all God's people said,